Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon, Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention, is back. SoonerCon 31 is scheduled for June 30th through July 2nd, 2023, in Norman, Oklahoma. It promises a weekend full of tabletop gaming, cosplay, and appreciation for literary sci-fi as well as TV and comics. Visit SoonerCon.com for more information. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is designed by fans for fans, with the aim of harnessing the power of fandom to raise money for charities. The Hellmouth Convention celebrates all fandoms, but particularly things like Buffy, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. Like the Hellmouth itself, things gravitate toward it that you may not find anywhere else. The next event is scheduled for June 9th through 11th, 2023, in Los Angeles, California. On tap today, we have Philip Milton. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so glad to have you here. I enjoyed your entry in the Sci-Fi Coffee's Writing Contest, the Coffee List Creatives Contest. And I am glad to see people like you are getting your voices out there in the sci-fi realm. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. So when you kind of, I, by the way, this story is going to be linked in the show notes. So anybody who's looking to read up on it would have the perfect opportunity to do that. How did you get your handle on this story? What, what kind of got that process going in your head? That's a good question. It's always, I always wonder when I'm done writing how I actually did it. It's, it's the, the process that's always a mystery to me. Once it's done, it's almost as if I forget when, once the final word gets on the page. I had had this idea um, uh, about a young boy, you know, looking up into, into space. Um, and I think I focused on the language more than anything else on this. I come from a, a background in theology. I've studied at the graduate level. And... Oftentimes, I like to incorporate uh, biblical tone or biblical language, and that's what kept me going. That's what centered me in uh, in writing the story. On, I'm on a personal level. I feel compelled to ask: When you were done with the story, did you know you were done, or did you just hit the point where you'd revised it to the point where you couldn't go any further? Oh, it's never done. Okay, it's Thank yeah. You. It's always a, either a time limit. Or I just get sick of what I'm writing and saying, all right, this is this is it. Yeah, it's never done. Okay. And I feel that way. I know a lot of creatives do feel that way. It makes me feel better that you <laughs> I'm not I'm in good company here. No, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think at this point, you, you know, someone needs to lock George Lucas up in a room and tell him you need to stop because at some point you just have to give it out and give it to the rest of the world because you're never going to be done. You're never going to be satisfied with what you produce. And so often the best parts of any creative work, be it a book, a movie, a song, it always comes from the limitations or the compromises we make, which end up being blessings in disguise. Exactly. It, it, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, any sort of good writing is going to have good editing it's going to have some sort of limitation where you have to go back and look at it and say, I can't just take the dictionary, cut it up and throw it on a page. I need to, to have some sort of form and some sort of limit. I had a, John Vorhaus was on many episodes ago now, and we were talking about the creative, creative process and essentially what it takes to go from having limitless options to having to limiting your options in some way shape or form creatively and even when you think you have unlimited options the the limitations you choose become part of the process it that's that's very true it, it is um it, you know you talk to any writer they're going to have more ideas than they could ever use and you have to pick the the, the right idea you have to put it in the right form. And, and, and then I, I think on the other side of the coin that so many people, they get lazy and they limit themselves. Um, I mean, there's so much writing out there that's just lazy. You have all these options, pick something crazy, throw a dinosaur in your story, you know? Um, we never have enough dinosaurs. No, we never have enough dinosaurs. Absolutely not. 
So let, let, let's throw this out there. What is the distinction between a limitation that you're put on yourself that harms the work and a limitation that's imposed on the work for its benefit? I think a major limitation that writers impose upon themselves are is expecting perfection the moment they put pen to paper, finger to keyboard. Um, it, it's something that keeps good writing from being written. Um, A limit that's an imposed in writing that that makes it makes it better is say even a word count. Now I know word counts can sort of be passe for writers because they say, well, you 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 use what you need to tell the story, but you, you can you can throw a hundred thousand words on the paper and it's a terrible story. You cut twenty thousand words out and it's an amazing story. And we still live in the world where you need, it's better to have some sort of vehicle for your story, be that a magazine, a book, and those vehicles tend to have some sort of guideline as to how big your story should be. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to just have whatever length of story you want unless you self-publish, which I totally advocate that. I'm a big fan of that, but a lot of people do want to go that traditional publishing route, and they will tell you you have to be a certain length and that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I mean, it, it's, it's a business. I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a bad habit of trying to, uh, to, to, to limit yourself in any sort of commercial sense, you know, you know, to be thinking about, well, is this going to sell? Is it not going to sell? But it is a business at the end of the day, if you're going that professional route and you have to understand that those gatekeepers that are publishing your work you're going to have to abide by some of their guidelines. Mm -hmm. and, and there are our ways around the gatekeeper, gatekeepers. Take them at your own peril. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm, again, I am an advocate of self-publishing, but it comes with its own set of consequences, which you need to be mindful of. Yeah, I, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, I, there are countless poets out there that have tried to, to get published in the New Yorker, which is just next to impossible. You might as well win, win the lottery. So... It, the, the gatekeepers, you know, do you have more opportunities to get your work heard, you know, get to get your work read and seen? A absolutely. But those gatekeepers still are out there. And again, to get to get back to our original point, sure. it's if you're, you know, they kind of know what people are looking for. That word count is just a good guideline, because otherwise you have people who are writing these 10,000 volume, uh, you know, volume ep epics for you know, that tell a minor story. Exactly. Um, you know, as, as, as much as uh, people just seem to devour series, you know, books that go on and on, which, which is great. Um, but but you're, you're right. It's, it's, if you have an epic story to tell, tell it. But if you're stretching it out for a word count, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I have, you know, another first friend of mine is, has written a many a, a trilogy and then wrote an, another trilogy on top of it. And each one of those is a solid story in and of itself. The trilogy builds on that, but there was never a need to just pump up the, the, the word count. And, and I'm repeating myself and I do apologize for that. It's just, I, I appreciate the fact of being able to talk to somebody who understands that you, the story is going to have to be what it is, make it the best you can. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we're all not, you know, Charles Dickens here, you know, counting the words and getting paid by, you know, by the word. So we'll, we're going to stretch it out and, and uh, you know, to take three pages to describe the scene when it could be described in a paragraph. But I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And, and, and to, to repeat myself, too, it is a business. And, and the people that are the gatekeepers know what people are looking for and what they can produce as commercial producers. So when you got the chance to write this, were you looking to write something that you would yourself would want to read? Is this in your wheelhouse as just as a fan or was this a challenge for you? It, 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 everything that I write, it's, it's something that I would want to read. Um, it, 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 it's, I'm writing for myself, e even when I'm trying to, you know, say, say I read 
something that I like and that style is in my head and I'm trying to emulate that style, whether it's conscious or, or unconscious. Um, but it's always going to be something that I would want to read because I have to sit there for hours and read it and reread it. I'm not going to want to, you know, write something that I don't want to read myself, even if usually by the end of it, I'm absolutely sick of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that's another thing that people who are writing to sell something tend to miss is that it, you're the only person who can write like you. Everybody is trying to write what they think is going to sell, what the market is telling them they want. But if you want to read this, somebody else probably does too. Absolutely. Uh, it's, I, I don't, maybe I, I have stars in my eyes, but it's, it's that whole idea of writing for the market just does not appeal to me. I'd rather write for myself because you're exactly right. Somebody else and probably a lot of somebody's are going to want to read that. I mean, you, you look at the fan fiction community where you have thousands and thousands of stories and these people are so dedicated to this and it's a community where they all love it and they eat it up and they keep these websites alive. I, and people will talk about you. They have 10,000 stories on a fan fiction website and there might be a couple where they only have 14 people that ever read it. Mm -hmm. But those 14 people might think the person who wrote it is a rock star. I, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you that you found your crew. And that's when you have a niche audience and in these subjects, sometimes that those 14 people can be all it takes to make it worthwhile. I, absolutely. I, I think even one other person. I mean, when you look at how many cult films and cult TV shows are out there where it doesn't have the the the, the broad audience, but that small dedicated group is what makes it makes it worthwhile. Like I just to use some examples like uh Office Space was originally a cult movie that got a bigger mm -hmm. following as time went on. Firefly, a cult TV show that just got bigger and bigger. And, and these things, like I'm, I'm, I'm giving examples of things that got bigger as they found their audience, but it doesn't happen right away. And that's something I think the, the market, quote unquote, does not get right now is that there are product properties that are going to take time to grow and, and be profitable and be popular. We need to wait for that. We do, we do need to wait for that. And unfortunately, where it's the, the point that we are, it feels like that we are in the creative community. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking like, like mass, uh, um, mass entertainment, you know, wide entertainment. Um, it, they're not letting people be creative. You're not, you don't have that one person or a group of people being creative. It's creativity by committee, which never works. And mm -hmm. it's just, you can, you can feel it. Even if you can't point to it, you can feel and, and see how it's hollow. You can. And what you're left with is something that is technically very good when it comes to the, the craft. And, and you, you can't spot a flaw in the, the, the structure of the plot. The plot might be full of a million holes, but the structure of it is sound according to the Sid Field. And the, the CGI might be completely flawless, un, indistinguishable from you know, an actual photograph, but you don't have the, the feel of something that was truly crafted. The, the crafting of it goes away. It, it, exactly. It's, it, it's the... Um... It, it's it's the difference between someone that has the technical skill and someone that has spent years mastering the craft that they know every little bit of what they're what they're doing instead of just checking boxes and saying well we have x y z this should be a hit and time and again the audience is saying no it's not that great yeah or they do what happens more often than not where they they meet the expectations of the box office or they sell the right number of books enough to convince them to make another of the exact same thing. It does, it's not a runaway hit, but it keeps paying the bills so they keep putting it out. It, it, exactly. It's just good enough to warrant throwing a little more, little more money into it. And, and it, the sad part is, is that they would they would probably make even more money if they took really talented people and just let them do what they need to do instead of meddling in it. Mm -hmm. But because it makes just enough money, they'll continue doing what works because it's the safe thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I've said to other guests that 
what we don't get right now, or you and I get this, okay, but the people with the big suits don't get this. When the safe properties now weren't safe when they hit the world for the first time. We're, we're making a fifth Indiana Jones movie. The first time they made an Indiana Jones movie, that was not safe. That was something new. It was a risk. It wasn't perfect. It, it had problems, but it was something special that people said, oh, I like that. How did you do that? Tell me more. It, I, I completely agree. I, I, I think my eyes rolled in the back of my head when I, I found out they were making a fifth Indiana Jones movie, especially since the original trilogy ends perfectly and they're riding mm -hmm. off into the sunset. Why would you mess with that? Mm -hmm. And do we really need to see an 80-year-old Indiana Jones running around? What more can be said creatively? The story is finished. Why mm -hmm. keep going? Yeah, Because I, it's all nostalgia. It is. And I personally think that the third movie is the best of the three, which I normally don't say that about a trilogy, but I, I really think Last Crusade upped the ante perfectly. I didn't totally hate Crystal Skull for what it attempted to do. I didn't consider it to be on the same level as the first three, but I, I get it. It was an attempt, but then to kind of walk that back and say, now we're just going to go back to that well again. You, you, you really, you're shaking my confidence here considerably. I would rather you just make a whole new character with that formula than try to just go to the Xerox machine again. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, when you have a movie like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it's that was it was one of the first of this new wave of of I'm not going to say reboots, but continuations of old mm -hmm. properties where it's just sloppy writing mm -hmm. and it's sloppy filmmaking where technically it's I mean, it's a beautiful looking movie, especially the beginning shot and the beginning shots in that in the, um, the warehouse, which we didn't need to see to begin yeah. with. The mystery is lost. Um, it's it's technically a good movie, but it's just sloppy writing. There's there's no there, there's you have so much potential with the character. If you're going to go there, just go all out. I mean, I, it, swinging you know swinging with the monkeys. I mean, it's mm -hmm. was that necessary? No, you know, I can, I, I understand people like the formula. Harrison Ford is not the gentleman he used to be in terms of being an act, credible action star. Mm -hmm. Passing the torch to Shia LaBeouf was a good idea in concept, but they're not, they didn't go back and, and actually make a, a series of movies with him. They just said, no, we're going to bring back an even older Harrison Ford. I, that loses the, the, att the attempt was good. The execution was not. I, I think you're right. And you know what? We already had the old Harrison Ford with the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, Chronicles, which is great. I remember watching that as, as a kid and I still have good memories of sitting there. And just, I was just thinking this now that the old, old Indiana Jones in young Indiana Jones Chronicles was only about 10 years older than Harrison Ford is now. That's a good point. Yeah. So uh, like uh, another example of, of something that if, if you like the, the concept, just keep running with it. Um, how did you feel about the movie Van Helsing? If I've you never just, seen it. Okay. I've never uh, seen it. It's not well received. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a monster fighting movie. Fans of it are... I personally like it for this reason. It's a James Bond movie in formula. Okay. And I love James Bond movies, but I can see that that formula is getting stale with the Cold War theme. So I thought, oh, well, something that's like, you know, Victorian monsters, putting that spin on it would be great. And that, again, they just never went back to that. Mm -hmm. There are so many good properties out there that are just being neglected, misused. I'm a huge fan of The Shadow. We had the early, the early 90s film with uh, mm -hmm. Alec Baldwin, which has its own problems, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of behind the scenes problems with uh, with the budget, um, had a lot of potential. But it's just sitting there languishing. And, and I belong to a, a dedicated community of at least a couple hundred people where every day they're talking about this and they're collecting the items and they're pointing out their favorite magazines and showing off their collections. Why not do something like this? Dr. Sin is, an, is another great one that, you know, Disney uh, 
uh, Disney made a film in, in the uh, 60s with uh, what Patrick McGowan from uh, The Prisoner. It's, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with it or not. I'm not, I don't know this one. It, yeah, it's, it's basically, think Batman set in, um, I think it's maybe 16, 1700s England. And it has such potential, but it's just sitting there while we're remaking the same stories again and again but they're just making just enough money to warrant mm -hmm. to keep going. And I mean, we could get into the, the, the weeds about why this is going on. And mm -hmm. I, I don't pretend to know all the in and outs of Hollywood politics and economics, but I, as a fan, a deep fan of these things, I see the trends and I see areas where it just looks like they're playing things too safe. When there are people like yourself to bring it back to your story who are trying to put out, something genuinely new that could be genuinely worth a risk and it might not work out i mean somebody might get your your story and say hey let's write a script and we're going to give it to some yokel and then we'll give it to roger corbin to direct and it's going to you never know but why not try no i i, I get that and it, it's 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 funny that you say something something new because uh, Oftentimes, my approach to writing is so. I'll put it this way: in, I looked at this this story that I was writing as a story about yesterday's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That I, I find writing, um, either writing or watching stories set in in a contemporary era, just boring. Send me to the future or send me to the past. Mm -hmm. So, in, in this case at least in my story we've already been to the moon we've already sent men and women up in, in you know in, into space what about that magic of before we did that looking at these rockets and just thinking about where we could go i love looking at this they say the, the the future of the past um in particular things from like the 30s and 40s mm. old old film serials or old cartoons where they have that aesthetic of we don't even know how a rocket would work but we kind of see where this is going exactly yeah exactly i i, I love that as as well there is there is a great blog called paleo future um it's been around maybe for a decade now mm -hmm. and um this i i don't know the the name of the the man that uh, that runs it but it's just page after page of that going back to the 19th century of this optimism that we just, I don't know if we have that anymore. Going through the 20th century of, I mean, just, just what they thought 1990 or 1999 would be like. We seem to have these cycles that are dependent on what's going on in the world, right? We're, we're in a very dystopian cycle right now. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 back in the '70s with the with the gritty dystopian mm -hmm. science fiction of uh, you know Logan's Run or Silent Running, mm -hmm. and um, maybe something can come up that's a Star Wars that keeps us uh, a little optimistic, even though Star Wars is 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 not really science fiction. <laughs> what you'd see, like, were that came out of the idea of you know we're inevitably going to get blown up in the nuclear war it's just a matter of when so mm -hmm. what comes after that whereas you know you go back to the 19th century and you just had this idea of you know we're we have this great boom of science we see so many things happening in terms of politics on the world stage where surely people are going to stop fighting war surely we're going to use technology only for good reasons and i don't quite understand how they had either of those notions but it, it was the thought at the time yeah well you you think about how 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 violent and how brutal uh you know the, the year 1000 to let's say 16 1700 was about in constant fighting and you did have a period of relative uh, peace that we're, we're still living in now and then you have this science and this technology and this industry just exploding can you just imagine, you know, looking at a world that that's still, you know, um, unexplored, and you have all this pushing you forward? You can, I, I can't imagine having that sort of optimism. Meanwhile, we have the entire universe in front of us, mm -hmm, and we're mm -hmm. slowly inching towards that technology. I mean, I know we're going back to the moon now. That's just that that 
that just makes me so happy that we're doing that again. Maybe it's something that we can look forward to. Maybe it is, and maybe getting back there and knowing knowing that there is a human being on the moon right this second, whenever we can actually say that and have that conversation, it'll, it'll shift our perspective a little bit, knowing that, hey, maybe we do belong there. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we do. And, and of course, beyond the moon, the next step is, is Mars, mm-hmm. as, as, as it should be, you know. Um, you know, and this is stuff that we've been looking at for, you know, you look at Ray Bradbury and the Martian Chronicles in, in, in the 50s, you know, they wanted to be there in the 50s. And we're this close. We're this close to getting there. But that first step we got to get back is back to the moon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Bill, I really appreciate what we've done here. I really appreciate your story. Where can people follow your on the Internet and follow your adventures? Um, right now, um, they could just keep looking out. Um, I have nowhere to direct them to right now, (laughs) but I've got a link to your story and I'm sure they can check on that from there. And hopefully you've got something else coming out soon, or at least you're, you've got something in the works. I, I am working on something right now. I usually don't like to talk about what I'm, uh, what I'm writing, but, um, I'll just say, here there be dragons. I respect that, and I'm completely behind that. Phil, thank you so much for being here. I'd be glad to have you back anytime. Thank you for having me. Gladly. 